there is no widespread agreement as to which written work should be recognized as the earliest example of a time travel story. Since a number of early works feature elements ambiguously suggestive of time travel, ancient folk tales and myths sometimes involved something akin to traveling forward in time. For example, in Hindu mythology, the Mahabharata mentions the story of King Raivata Kakudmi, who travels to heaven to meet the creator Brahma. When King Kakudmi returns to earth, he is shocked to learn that many ages have passed. Fiction aside, here is my list of top five people who may actually have traveled through time. Number five, John Titor. A person named John Titor started posting on the internet one day, claiming to be from the future and predicting the end of the world. Then he suddenly disappeared, never to be heard from again. His story started in late 2000 when he signed onto the internet. A poster going by the screen names Time Travel Zero and John Titor posted on a variety of message boards, beginning with the forum at the Time Travel Institute. He claimed he was a soldier sent from 2036, the year a computer virus wiped the world. His mission was to head back to 1975 in order to snatch and grab an IBM 5100 computer, which had the necessary equipment to fight the future virus. His detour to the year 2000 was simply to get a little rest and relax while visiting his three-year-old self, ignoring every fabric of time paradox rule from the time travel stories. Titor said that the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics was correct. Over the next four months, Titor responded to every question other posters had, describing future events in poetically phrased ways, always submitted with a general disclaimer that alternate realities do exist. So his reality may not be our own. In between dire urgings to learn first aid and stop eating beef, mad cow disease was a serious threat in his reality. Titor provided a number of technical specs regarding how time travel worked. With overly complex algorithms and grainy hard to make out photos of his actual machine, which yes, of course, was installed in the rear of an automobile, a 1967 Chevy Corvette and later a 1987 Chevy Suburban. He even showed off his cool futuristic military insignia. On March 24, 2001, Titor offered his final piece of advice. Bring a gas can with you when the car dies on the side of the road, he said. Then he signed off forever and returned home. He was never heard from again. And number four, Andrew Basiago. In 2004, Washington-based attorney Andrew D. Basiago began telling his story of a top-secret organization called Project Pegasus. Although he was only seven years old at the time, Basiago claims he had from 1968 to 1972 participated in a number of bizarre experiments that took him on journeys through time, space, and potentially into parallel universes. The mission was to study the effects of time travel and teleportation on children, as well as to relay important information about past and future events, quote, to the U.S. president, intelligence community, and military. According to Basiago, children were recruited specifically for their ability to adapt, quote, to the strains of moving between past, present, and future, end quote. While Basiago claims there were several time travel devices at work during these experiments, the majority of his temporal adventures can be attributed to our old friend Nikola Tesla. Documents allegedly retrieved from Tesla's New York City apartment after his death in January of 1943 revealed the schematics for a teleportation machine. Using something Basiago calls radiant energy, the machine would form a shimmering curtain between two elliptical booms. Passing through this curtain of energy, Basiago would enter a vortal tunnel that would send him to his destination. Several of his voyages led him to the 1800s. On one occasion, he found himself at Gettysburg on November 19, 1863, the day President Abraham Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg Address. As Basiago tells the story, he had been dressed up as a Union bugle boy, however, 
He felt that his oversized shoes were drawing too much attention, so he wandered away from the crowd, only to be photographed. Each trip, he says, was slightly different than the last, leading Basiago to believe that it wasn't just time travel at work. He was being sent into, quote, slightly different alternative realities on adjacent timelines, end quote. Number three, Sir Robert Victor Goddard. In 1935, Sir Robert Victor Goddard was flying to Edinburgh from Andover, England. And while on this perfectly ordinary flight, he passed over a dilapidated airfield in Drem, Scotland. This place had long been abandoned to the point where foliage had overtaken most of the area and cattle had made themselves at home. That's what Goddard saw as he flew over, a farm with a whole lot of nothing going on. So he continued on his way until he reached his destination. A few days later, Goddard began his trip back to Andover. He took the same route, which would lead him once again over Drem. But before he could get there, he ran into a peculiar storm. The storm clouds were yellow. It didn't take long for Goddard to become disoriented and lose control of his plane. He tried to regain control by climbing above the yellow clouds, but they seemed to have no end. His plane began to fall. Fortunately for him, that's when something unexpected happened. The clouds broke and he could see the ground again. As he approached the airfield, hoping to reorient himself, suddenly the storm vanished and the sky turned bright and sunny. It stopped raining. Everything became clear, but something was different this time. The airfield at Drem was no longer abandoned. In fact, it looked good as new. He could see mechanics down below and four planes, each painted yellow, sat on the runway. One was a model he'd never seen before, a monoplane unlike anything in the Royal Air Force in 1935. And what were the mechanics wearing? Blue overalls. This, along with the yellow planes Goddard found strangest of all. RAF mechanics in 1935 wore brown overalls, not blue, and there were no yellow planes to his knowledge. Goddard didn't have much time to think about it, though, because he was flying too quickly to truly understand what he was seeing. By the time he'd pass over the airfield, the storm had suddenly returned, and the bright sunlight dissolved into hard rain, and those strange yellow clouds engulfed him once more. Once again, he found himself battling for control of his airplane, but this time he won and was able to land safely at his home base. The final twist to this bizarre account. In 1935, the vision that Sir Victor Goddard saw at the Drem airfield actually came to pass. The RAF began to paint their training planes yellow, and a new monoplane, the Magister, just like the one he witnessed in 1935, joined the roster. By that year, even the mechanics' overalls had been updated to blue. And of course, the airfield at Drem had made a comeback. At number two, Al Balik. Al describes what he remembers after he jumped off the USS Eldridge in 1943 when he was involved with the Philadelphia experiment. Hello, my name is Alfred Balik, more commonly known as Al Balik. Original family name is Edward Cameron. And the purpose of it is to present my history as I best have researched it over the years as I have learned it as comprehensive as it can possibly be. I have been involved in the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, time travel, alien connections of the Montauk Project, and some other projects, all of which have been secret over the years, most of which have never been declassified. It is to give you a base of information, as I have found it, certainly not everything that may be known on these subjects, but all that I have acquired, which is over 11 years. When I first became aware of my involvement with the Philadelphia Experiment in January 1988, I had no idea how extensive my use, shall we say, by the government has been, nor where my research would go. I have been involved in many radio presentations, over 50, such people as Art Bell, Mike Siegel, uh, Mr. Jarvis, and others and in terms of direct presentations before a live audience, over 50 around the world, extensively in the United States, in Europe, and in Australia. 
Their subjects covered have been from the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, mind control, some discussion of aliens, and related subjects. And they all fit together. They're trying to understand how they fit together and the complex web which is involved is really the purpose of the CD so that you, the viewer, may get some better idea of what information you have been, been denied by our government, been denied by the media, with a few exceptions, and give you a base of information so you can do your own research. Those of you who may be skeptical because, frankly, the presentation is going to become rather bizarre as we go on with it. For those of you who are skeptical, I say fine. It is quite healthy to be skeptical, which means you don't accept either, either I or any of the other presenters on the CD say at face value. But go do your homework if you don't quite believe us, which is, as I say, quite healthy. Do your own homework, your own research, and I f feel confident that eventually you will understand that what we are presenting is the truth. But that is for you to decide. The purpose is to educate. The purpose is to get you to think. The purpose is to help you to understand things which you may have wondered about for years and which you have had only very sketchy information presented to you from other sources. He believes he has not been harmed or stopped because his time traveling experiences locked him into his timeline. Somehow, by being here today, he among others in the program served to balance the effects they produced from prior time traveling experiences. And at number one, Leonardo da Vinci. When describing Leonardo da Vinci's scientific achievements, it's hard to avoid using the phrase ahead of his time. His careful observations and logical analysis in fields from astronomy to physiology seemed a world apart from anything his contemporaries were doing. And it took centuries for mainstream science to catch up to his insights. It's as if someone took a modern scientist and teleported them into the Renaissance. He was a painter, sculptor, architect, scientist, musician, mathematician, engineer, inventor, anatomist, geologist, astronomer, cartographer, botanist, historian, and writer. Leonardo da Vinci's work covering a staggering range of disciplines is still influencing science, technology, medicine, art, and numerous other fields nearly half a millennia after his death. But just who was Leonardo da Vinci? Was he simply a man of profound intellect and imagination? What most people know about Leonardo is that between 1476 to 1478, there is a gap in his life. What happened to him during this period and why did he vanish? We ask this especially when it was precisely during this period when he was just beginning to come into prominence. How could someone like him go somewhere and that there be no written evidence? When considering all theories, what could explain such behavior? How could a man like Leonardo vanish without a trace for a period of time? Some believe that during his time away, he received tutoring from beings not of this earth. What we know for certain is that when Leonardo reappeared in Florence in 1478, his creative output reached a whole new level, going beyond art and extending to a number of other disciplines. He would produce aerial maps of Italian cities with such incredible accuracy. He would design and build the world's first self-propelled vehicle, and he would invent machines years and even centuries ahead of their time. What do you guys think? Which potential time traveler fascinates you the most? Please put your comments below.